I've been on a teaching uh, sabbatical for five weeks, and uh, what we do is um, build into our staff protocols that at key junctures in their ministry, we give them an opportunity to get away, refresh, and that's what I did. Um, the first week, or, or one of the weeks, I had an opportunity to go see my parents, which I hadn't seen since the pandemic hit. And uh, they're struggling in different ways with their health, and it was just so good for all the siblings to come together and be there. Um, I spent a couple weeks studying for this next year. I'm really fired up about what we're going to be doing over this next year as a church, how we're going to be reaching out uh, into the community and beyond, and what we're going to be doing internally in our church. And so it was really good to do that. And then we spent two weeks in Turkey, uh, the country of Turkey. Uh, after uh, Jesus rose from the dead, uh, basically all of the New Testament centered on Turkey. And I thought it would be amazing to go there, um, but um, it, 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 uh, anybody that tells you that there's no real impact of Islam, go to Turkey see what's happening in Turkey, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And it was just really hard at each biblical site. You know, the Apostle John was writing here, I'm looking over the bus stop at a, at a man that's wearing shorts and a, and, a, and a T-shirt, and his son's wearing shorts and a T-shirt, he's 13 years old, and then they have a wife and three daughters. It's 105 degrees outside in complete black garb. It was just, anyway, I don't want to get into that. But it was good to... Uh, study that area of Turkey and to um, be with some of the world's best biblical scholars and retool. Some of you have the opportunity where you work to get away for continuing education. It was really cool. Lisa, however, got bored after a while, uh, after geeking out on all of these classes. It was literally lectures all day and going out and seeing rocks. And so I think the highlight of her trip to Turkey was seeing this. Can you, can you bring that video up? Can you show the video? You're going to show it here or up there? She had me get a Turkish shave. Have you ever got a Turkish shave? A Turkish shave is where they apply wax all over your face. Now, some of you have been waxed uh, before, and I'm going to cut it off right before they rip the wax off my ears and my face because I swore. It was so painful. Why do you wax yourself? It was the worst. The highlight for me was going to St. John's Basilica. And um, I need to set this up. So St. John's Basilica. So um, Jesus, when he came to earth, lived to bring the map up here. Um, the map. Or is it, are we going to do map up? Okay, so Jesus basically lived and served in Galilee, went to Jerusalem. He died, rose from the dead, and the apostles stayed mainly in Jerusalem until they were scattered. In 68 AD, the Romans came and they were sick and tired. If you can go to the next map, they were sick and tired of the Jews being obstinate. And so in 68 AD, in 69, 71, 72, um, they came and destroyed Jerusalem and Peter was already dead. Paul was dead. Almost all of the apostles were dead. The only one that was left was the apostle John. And he went from Jerusalem all the way over here to a city called Ephesus. Here's Rome. Imagine Rome, New York City. Ephesus is Philadelphia. John stayed there for 25 years. He was the sole remaining apostle. He wrote the Gospel of John from Ephesus, the book of Revelation from Ephesus, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He was the last living person that knew Jesus, that had touched Jesus, that had hugged Jesus, that had lived with Jesus. And to go to Turkey and be able to go to a hill that was on the north side of Ephesus that, or the west side of Ephesus, east side of Ephesus actually, that had the actual body of the Apostle John. This is what it was like for me. Take a look.
This is St. John's Basilica. After John died, the early, early church wanted to preserve his body and his memory. There's 100% agreement that this is the tomb where the Apostle John is buried. The Apostle John that met Jesus on the Sea of Galilee, that had a temper, that was one of his innermost disciples, who essentially was the anchor for Christianity in the last 25 years of the first century and gave us some of the last writings in the New Testament. This is where he is buried. And I stood there for 30 minutes. The group had gone on, and I just, I, I, I just want to stay here, guys. And I just stood there, and I started going over his life and thinking about his life and what he meant to the church and what an example he is for those of us that live in a culture that is antagonistic towards Christianity. A culture that beginning in first grade, all the way through the end of college and on the media, that is antagonistic and anti-Christ in almost every way. He had the exact same experience. We're starting a new series today called Believe This, and it's on John's, the, at the end of the New Testament, it's called First John. John wrote a gospel, which is a book of stories of Jesus, and First and Second and Third Johns are letters about what to believe when you're in an antagonistic environment, what to teach your kids, what to make sure that you study together in your groups. One of the th what are the things that you need to die on the hill for? That's what 1 John is about. Now, John wrote 1 John, had it copied and sent all over uh, Western Turkey. And the reason he did is look at this verse. It says, dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Who's the Antichrist? It's Tom Brady. It's Tom Brady. <laughs> Even now, it says many Antichrists have come. A lot of people were like, there's going to be one person. Many people that oppose Christ. That's what an Antichrist is. In fact, there were many people that oppose Christ. And this is how we know it's the last hour. They went out from us, from our church, and went and started other churches, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us in terms of the theology of what, they, what we believe. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. And so what we're going to do is we're going to jump into this letter, and there are some of the most powerful teachings in this letter that I've encountered in a long time. And I'm really hoping that those of you who are joining us line, online, you feel just as connected, because I feel just as connected to you. I talk to you. I email with you. I, I, I get the experience of, of why you're um, online joining us for the time. I hope you feel just as connected with what we're going to be going through because if you imagine that there's elderly John, the last of the apostles, an elderly wise man that had an opportunity to speak into our lives, what would he say? Here's what he would say. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was from the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. I want to just go through a few phrases with you real quick. The first is, that which was from the beginning. People during John's time were saying Jesus was just a person. He was born just like a person. He died just like a person. And yeah, he's a nice teacher and everything, but... He was just a human being. And what John is saying is, you don't understand, no, no, no. He was at the beginning. In other words, he's eternally existent. 
What is, what is the book of the Bible in, in Genesis? What's the very beginning of the book of the Bible in Genesis say? What does it say? First line. In the beginning what? In the beginning God. And what John is saying is that in the beginning, Jesus was God. Now, it was important then in Turkey, and it's important now. I'm driving here, uh, Lisa, we're driving together, and we had to stop at Wawa, because just like you, she gets one cup of coffee, 24 ounces, which is actually three cups of coffee, but she doesn't listen to me anymore. While I'm uh, waiting for her uh, to get her coffee, there is a guy dressed up to go golfing. It's Sunday morning, go golfing. That's, that's what you do. And why does it matter to that guy who's going to skip being in community with one another? Why does it matter to that guy? Because Jesus is not some teacher, some nice teacher that teaches values that you can get around to, uh, you know, uh, thinking about every once in a while and, 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 you know, teaching your kids values. Jesus is God and he has a claim on your life. Unlike all the religions on the world, he is the one that created you. He is the only one that has the ability to help you experience life as it was meant to be. And I'll tell you right now, it's not golfing on Sunday. Trust me, you're not that good. I get wanting to have a place to have an outlet and that sort of thing. We all need to have ways that we can get out, we can have outlets, but we need to have priorities because he is the priority. Now, why does it matter what religion? Every single religion that's ever been created on the planet, other than Christianity, was created by human beings. I talked a little bit about Turkey. I remember being in Cairo, Egypt, 110 degrees outside. Here's a man, his son, his two daughters, and his wife, and they're completely covered head to toe. God loves Muslims. I love Muslims. I hate Islam. Because what it does to women. We were in Turkey. We go to the Hagia Sophia, which used to be a church, converted to a mosque. We go to the front, and Muslim men are praying up front. And Lisa asked the question, where are the women? The women are in the back behind the shoes that we took off. Now, it's not just the Islam. It's this. When humans make up a religion, it always becomes a tool of oppression. Always. Someone's going to lose when someone makes up a religion. But if Jesus is God and he is eternal, it's not a religion. It, it, it's life. It's not a religion. It's not rules. It is life. I would encourage you, for those of you who are skeptical about this and you think I'm just blowing you smoke, right? I would encourage you to read John Ortberg's book, Who is This Man? Where he documents in detail the last 2,000 years of what Christians have done in every continent to make life better for people. You get rid of Christianity, this world's going to kill itself. Look at what John says next. Which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have looked at and our hands have touched. I love this picture, this image of John walking along the Sea of Galilee, putting his hand on Jesus' shoulder. Jesus pushing him in the water, laughing. You know, having a good time with one another. Teaching him, he's like, I knew him. These other people that are teaching things that are contrary to good teachings from the Bible. These people have no idea what they're talking about. I knew him. Get this teaching out, John is saying. I love what he says next. This is why it's important. This we proclaim concerning the word of zoe in Greek. Life. The life. Three times it says here. Concerning the word of life. The life appeared, which we have seen and we testify it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life. When John talks about life, he's not, he's not talking about having a pulse or losing a pulse. 
He's talking about experiencing the reason you have a pulse in the first place. A lot of you are here, and you're new, and you're asking yourself, I came to kids' camp, why do these people go all the trouble? They're spraying water and that sort of thing. Why are they doing that? They, it's because we know you're alive, but as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, you're dead. You're dead inside. Yeah, you have nice things, you go on vacations, you look attractive, you look like things are going fine, but you're dead inside. And John is saying, he came to give us life. You're like, I'm already alive. And he's like, that's not the point. It was so good to go back to Columbus and, and be with my mom and dad. My dad has been struggling. His renal cell cancer has been metastasized. And he's been struggling with cancer for 14 years. You want to know what Jesus is like? Go spend time with my dad. I have never heard my dad complain one time. My mom has a small tumor in her brain. Her vision is occluded. We go out to dinner on Friday night and um, it was her birthday. So my sister found an Italian restaurant in Grandview Heights, which is a, 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 it's a nice area of Columbus that used to be close to where she lived. We thought that she would really enjoy that. And so we ordered, and then I said, let's just go around and share what's your earliest memory of mom or your most memorable or funny uh, story. And we laughed for almost two hours. And the reason is it wasn't just nice stories and stuff like that, it's that my mom and dad met when a man came knocking on my mom's door and said, I'm starting a church in this area and I need people to help set up. Would you be willing to come on Saturday and help set up? And so my, my mom, at 14 years of age, helped start a new church. My dad visited this church, the youth group, and he saw that he says, quote, the girl with the cute legs. And they dated through high school. They got married. They had us. Church planning was in my blood. What we experience when we get together as a family is life in the midst of difficulty. See, when you, when you think of eternal life right now, what you need to think of is that you, for those of you who are disciples of Jesus, you already have eternal life. But it's like being in a big mansion where heaven is just in the mansion, we're over here, but there's just a door that's closed. It's the same life. True joy is something that the world can't give you and the world can't take it away. See, what we struggle with in this culture, oh my gosh, I've struggled with this, is the when-then syndrome. When-then. When this happens, then I will be, I'll be happy, right? When this happens, then I'll work on my marriage. When I get done with school, then my life will begin. When I get into third grade, then I will work on my character. When I get into 10th grade, then I'll stop drinking. When I get married, then I'll be happy. When I get divorced, then I'll be happy. When I lose weight, beat this disease, get that procedure, get that job, move to that place, fix that problem, then I will be happy. Look at what John says next about this. He says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and what we've heard so that you may have, I want you to notice this word and I never want you to forget this word, so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. If I can get, if we can understand this concept, we'll never be the same. When you, fellowship comes from the Greek word koinonia which means to share with one another. 
Koinos is the Greek word for common. When you are in fellowship with one another, you've made an agreement that we are going to share together. When we lived in Ohio, I had a neighbor that would always come over and borrow stuff. I was like, yeah, because he brought it back. Hey, can I borrow this? Can I borrow this? Can I borrow this? And if you had a neighbor that came over and said, hey, would you mind if I borrowed that tool or I borrowed this blower or this whatever, if you had a relationship, if you were in fellowship with them, you would let them borrow it. But if a stranger came to your door and said, hey, can I borrow your car, what would you say? Hmm, no, because you're not in fellowship with one another. Um, you will notice I'm not wearing my, my wedding ring. I'll give you two options to help understand what's happening. Option number one, Lisa burnt my steak. <laughs> Don't burn my steak. I looked at her and I said, that's it. I'm gonna see what's out there. <laughs> Laugh said, go ahead. <laughs> Option number two is, I was hiking up a 45 degree angle and uh, as I was coming up, my right foot slipped and I slammed literally my ring finger on a corner of a rock and my finger ballooned up like it was a, or it was a cartoon. I'm looking at my finger. It's literally oh, at least 50% added to the size of the next finger. I'm going to bed, and Lisa was like, you'll be fine. I get up the next morning. It's bigger. I'm like, I'm going to lose my finger. She was like, yeah, you're going to lose your finger. So we, <laughs> we went to the doctor, and they had to cut it off. But whether you have a ring on or not, when you make a commitment to one another that you are going to be in fellowship with one another... For those of you who are married or are thinking about getting married, you are going to share your life. You're going to share, obviously, your resources. You're going to share your time. You're going to share your life with one another. The book of Acts tells us that the early church in Acts chapter 4 shared their resources with one another. Why? Because they were in fellowship with one another. There's this little line in Acts chapter 14, or Acts chapter 4 that says this, they did not consider their possessions their own. They shared with one another. Now, obviously, if you're, you can do that when you're in a group and you're living in fellowship with one another. You're probably not going to come and someone says, hey, would you mind clearing out your bank account for me? You're not going to do that. But if they're going through a difficult time and you know about it, you might surprise them privately or even secretly hey, would you mind, can you go give this person this? Because that's what we do when we're in fellowship with one another. To be in fellowship means to share our resources, but to share our lives, but also our hearts. That's why before I left and went on a teaching sabbatical, we were, gonna, we were talking about the experience of our friends that are black and what they're going through. The Bible says that we're in fellowship fellowship with one another, and we're to carry each other's burdens. We have a few people signed up for this book talk that we're doing on Wednesday. Hopefully you'll be a part of it, seven o'clock right here. But all we want to do is we want to talk about what is your story and how can we share that burden? See this, when we put a wedding ring on, it's a, it signifies, I am now committed to you to live in fellowship with this one person. When we become a disciple of Jesus and we're baptized into the body of Christ, it says, we now are going to share our lives with our fellow brothers and sisters. Now, here's the mind-blowing thing. I, this is all set up to what I want you to know. John says that those of us who have given our lives over to the eternally preexistent God named Jesus... Not only are we given real life that starts now, but we are in fellowship with him. And you know what that means? God is your next door neighbor. You can borrow whatever you want from him. Whatever he has is yours. 
You've committed that you're going to be in fellowship with one another, not just each other, but with him as well. You need resources, he says, I'm going to supply all your needs. You need hope, he says, fear not. I am with you. You need friends, he's like, I got a lot of them. Just pick. You need a family, he's like, I got one of those too. Listen to this. With the exception of the new body and mind that we're going to get in heaven, everything you are waiting to receive in heaven you already have available to you right now on earth. Do you get that? Money, purpose, joy, community, beauty, wonder, everything. I don't know, I don't know, I'm, before I'm reading this, I'm like, I don't know what my conception of heaven is. With the exception of a new body and a new mind. We are already in heaven when we are in fellowship with one another. How many of you have been in a Bible study? How many of you have been in a conversation with someone that is a fellow believer and you're thinking to yourself in the middle of this, this is what heaven is like. You've been in the middle of a song, incredible arts ministry that we have here from the tech team all the way to the back. And you're in the middle of a song and you're like, this is what it feels like. We get these little tastes. But the reason we don't experience that more and more and more is we don't actually realize that we are in fellowship with God right now. And so... When you meet with your group this week and you discuss this passage, I want you to ask each other, how would our lives change if we stopped waiting to receive in heaven what is already available to us right now on earth? How would your emotional life change? How would your self-talk change? Huge issue. How would your relationship change? Your family, your job, your money, your future? John gives us a sneak peek into what would happen. He said, we write this to make, and then it says right here, go, go to the next verse. Go to the next one. All right. There's this issue in Greek, and it's this word, our, and they don't know whether to translate it, our, joy complete, or put a Y in front of it and translate it, your joy complete. And all the manuscripts that come down, half of them are like they put your and half of them our, which is the difficulty of this word. And the reason is, is there anything more joyous than experiencing the joy of Christ yourself, but also seeing a new friend experience it? And so John's like, I write all this stuff to make your joy complete, but dang it, I'm making my joy complete right now as I talk about it. In other words, this truth about Jesus is complete, not just when we experience and we hold it into ourselves, but we're gonna go tomorrow into our mission field we're gonna go from our driveway to the end of the world and we're gonna share this message of Jesus with friends, coworkers, and neighbors. And man, if you think your joy is complete when it's just held in to you, just imagine when you go onto your sports team, onto the sidelines of soccer and the 12,000th time you've been on a lacrosse sideline and basketball and swimming and all of this and then you lean over the person next to you and you start a conversation and somehow it opens up to you. Hey, you know what? You ought to come to church with me on Sunday. And a whole world opens up to them. All right, so I have some homework for you. Number one, I want you to read 1 John this week. And every single time there's a verse that speaks to you, I want you to underline it. And if you have a Bible that you can't underline in it, I definitely want you to underline in it. All right? So many times, these are not, these are not collector's items. Right? These are, oh, oh, it's duh. Don't, don't put duh. Don't touch it. Don't put the coffee around it. Nope. This is, 
This is not a collector's item. This is a weapon. Use it. Second, I want you to be here next week. Now, if you're going to go on vacation, you're choosing to go to hell. Uh, no, if you're, if you're not going to be here, I want, definitely want you to watch online. But third, I want you to invite a friend. Even if you're watching online, I want you to share the service with people. I want you to bring one friend. I want them to experience this life, and I want your joy to be complete when you introduce that person that not only you, but you're seeing other people come alive. Let's pray. Thank you so much, God, for being faithful to us. Thank you so much for bringing us in fellowship with you. Ancient people would tremble to go in and kill bulls and sacrifices just to get you to be not angry. But we get to share life with you. And you laugh. And we're walking down the Sea of Galilee and you push us in. God, help us to give, give us hearts for people who don't know you yet. Give us hearts for people who were like us at some point so that we can share the message of you with them and our joy may be complete. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.